I've I've had the thing for like a month or two. I just have always been streaming from the old one because I haven't fully configured OBS on the new one. Um, so let's see if it works. And let's see if we're live. It says we're live. Um, why do we not have any video? Is the fifty-two thousand dollar question. All right. Well, if it's going to be, if you're going to be annoying, Mister Computer, then we can make you, make you com. Um, Transform, fit to screen, there we go. Okay. All right, looks like we're good. Okay. All right, so um, uh, let's kind of get to it. So we're going to start talking about something completely different um, for basically most of the rest of the semester. Um, and that's uh, sort of a, a crash course, if you will, into the basics of machine architecture. And um, so uh, I'm going to demo sort of the idea behind it, and then we'll kind of dive in. Um, the other thing I wanted to tell you guys is, uh, well, first off, how did uh, the second iteration of the core skills exam go? Are we on the struggle bus? still yeah D improving hopefully though uh, not so much well i missed one question one more. Oh. Oh. that makes me a sad panda all right well same thing as la same drill as last week you'll have another shot at it starting wednesday um and you know we'll do two more of these so hopefully you can and <clears throat> i have gotten a couple of questions so uh, right now, it, Canvas is not set to do this, but it will be when we're all done with them, which is to drop all but your, you'll keep your highest one. Okay, but Canvas won't let me tell it to drop three scores if you haven't actually taken three exams yet, because that, duh. Uh, so I can't actually program that in until after we finish taking them. Um, so anyway. Um, yeah, and I've um, I've thought a lot about how to how we should kind of polish off the semester, um, and one piece I think is going to be good news for you guys. So we I was planning on us having a final exam, right? Which would look, you know, in many ways very much like the core skills exam that you were doing. So what would be much cooler? Not having a final exam. And any complaints on that? No? Okay, that's what I figured. Okay, now, that said, what are we going to do when our final would have been scheduled? Okay, which, by the way, um, is, I think ours is scheduled for the first day of exams, which is a Thursday, from 6 to 9 at night. Yeah. Those of you who have been around a while know that we've never had night exams before, but this was the downside of the COVID semester. Yes. Huh? What? Uh, I think there's only two or three slots that are at night. Um, so basically the problem was this. Normally we have five days worth of finals and in order to give you guys a reading day, basically a day with no classes to study, uh, that meant having only four days of finals because we also wanted to not have people taking finals on the Wednesday before, right before Thanksgiving because you guys need to like get out of here kind of thing, right? So, um, so because of that, there's only four days worth of finals. Well, there are 11 course time slots throughout the week and 
if you try and fit 11 things into four days, what does that mean? Some of those days are going to have to have three things, right? That's just the only way to do it. Um, and, and so, uh, and if we're going to have still three hour blocks for finals, what's the only way to stuff them in? Well, to have some of them at night. So, yeah. Um, so instead of taking a lame exam, we're going to have a uh, Twitch streaming party. Okay. So uh, I'm still trying to figure out the exact logistics of this, but basically what I'd like to do is um, we're going to Twitch stream all of y'all's uh, game projects. So Minecraft or Make Code or, or Scratch. Okay. And uh, the way that this will work, so I got this idea, I think it was maybe a week and a half ago or so. Um, I, uh, I've been every now and then going and watching either other streams or webinars or something that, that companies or whoever is, is, is hosting. And one of the ones that I went to, it's like a week or two ago, uh, was, um, during education week hosted by, uh, Unreal or Epic, Epic Games that makes the Unreal Engine. They also make Fortnite. So I don't know, you guys probably now have a mixed opinion of them, right? Unreal Engine good, Fortnite bad. Yeah, okay, anyway, it was education week, and so they were, uh, they had like a couple of, uh, of streams about, um, you know, different like college game design classes and, and other stuff like that, and they were, some of the students were showing off uh, some of their projects and and kind of talking a little bit about how they did certain things in there. And uh, I mean, this, I, I actually can uh, share the link with you guys. Cause of course, you know, they save the recordings of these things. It was phenomenal work that these, uh, these students had been doing now, granted they'd been working on these projects for like a year. Right. So this was not anywhere close to the kind of timeline that, that you guys have, but it gave me the idea. Oh, we should do the same sort of thing just with y'all's projects and it's six to nine at night. So that's kind of a good time for streaming and who knows, maybe we'll get a bunch of prospective students and your parents can join and uh, alums and stuff. And we'll have a grand old time. Um, so anyway, what that means though, you guys probably all have zoom on your computer so far. Yes. Uh, if you could guys also do the same with Discord, if you haven't already, uh, and make sure you get onto my Discord server. The link is on the uh, the course webpage. Um, I think most of you probably have already or know of Discord. Uh, so, uh, so I emailed the guy who hosted these things, and I was like, so, how'd you do that? It's like, actually, we just use Zoom and Discord and pipe those in as streams in OBS. And I'm like, sweet. That's easy. We can do that. Um, so anyway, that's what uh, that's what we're going to do. Um, OK, however, what that will mean is a couple of syllabus amendments um, because we're not doing a final and we'd previously planned on doing a final. So uh, I'll make those amendments and send you guys the info on Canvas. But that's the idea. The other slight downside is it means that we're going to have dueling projects going on. Right, so for a little while, you're going to have two projects going on simultaneously. Uh, that kind of sucks, but but you don't have a final, so right, you win some, you lose some. Okay, fantastic. So let's talk about um, let me get the canvas. Um, sort of the basics of machine architecture. Okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to pop open, actually, no, I won't do that. Um, let me make, I'm going to make a file here, and I'm going to uh, type some code in Python. Okay, uh, nothing particularly uh, fancy. <clears throat> Uh, let's just make a function and <laughs> we've done some recursive functions. So let me just uh, pick sort of my favorite recursive function.
Um, let's see, I want to return Okay, so this little program, what I've done is uh, I've written a routine called Fibonacci, and if I input zero or one, it will return the number one, and otherwise it will return Fibonacci of n minus one plus Fibonacci of n minus two, okay? Now, how many of you guys saw the Fibonacci numbers probably in high school, right? So what's the sequence? The first two Fibonacci numbers are one. And the next Fibonacci number is the sum of the previous two. So one, one, then two, then three, then five, and so on. Okay, eight, 13, so on. Okay, so uh, this is a good example of a recursive function. We've certainly talked about those. And uh, right, okay, so I'm gonna run this thing. Um, all right, so what did I call this? CSC101A, and I want to do Python 3. Okay, so uh, it executed that, and I got 8 printed from the console. That is the fifth Fibonacci number, so we're good, right? Yeah? Okay, now I'm going to write the exact same thing, but I'm going to write it in C. Okay, this will look a little different because C syntax is a little different, but not too much. So C is what uh, some people call curly brace language. Well, okay, so I want. Okay, so now with C, what I have to do is I have to compile this. Oh, blah. You'd be, be like, oh, duh. <clears throat> to include the header file. Okay. All right, so great. It printed it. All right, no big thing. Slightly different syntax. Okay. Um, but I wrote this thing in C. So first off, you guys can kind of see that, I mean, yeah, it doesn't look exactly like uh, like it did in Python, but pretty much the same, you know, little details here and there. So, okay. 
So what I want to talk about is how this actually gets executed on the computer, right? So you see this stuff that looks like high-level code, but ultimately, what is everything on a computer? Well, yeah, it's all binary, right? Zeros and ones, and crap tons of them. So how does this, or the Python variant, turn into all those zeros and ones? Right? What really is happening in the machine? Okay. Well, that's where we get to have some fun. Okay. So I'm going to do something. Okay. I'm going to output a new file called, well, actually, I'm going to do two of them. Let me do the other one. Okay, so I've made now here two new files. Let me open both of these guys. Okay. So, uh, and let me actually blow up the font a little bit. What was the zoom in control plus plus? Okay, fine. Okay. All right. So this is what I did. Okay. Was I took the C, uh, program and I did what's called assembling it okay so I took it and I had the program called the compiler basically output one level lower of code okay so when you guys write code there is high level code like Python Java C those sorts of things okay then there's a layer underneath of that called assembly and then there's a layer underneath of that, which is the bare machine code that's all the ones and zeros. Okay. And what we're going to start looking at are the two lower levels. Okay. The bare machine code and this stuff called assembly. Okay. Now, the C code, right, so is uh, you could take that and put it on any computer. And as long as you have the special program called a compiler, you could make my C code run on your computer. Okay, great. But when you get down to the assembly and the machine language, so the ones and zeros, uh, what kind, uh, how it looks will depend on what kind of computer you're running it on. Okay, so what kind of computer am I running this on right now? It's Mac, yes, but more fundamentally, what is it under the hood? What kind of, who made the processor? Intel, okay? So it's running a core i9, whatever, right? And um, yeah, I had to just drop that little detail, right? You scrubs with your i5s and uh, i7s, how quaint, okay? All right, so... It's got, you know, an Intel processor in it, and Intel architecture looks a particular way, okay? So all this gobbledygook that you guys see is all um, assembly for Intel architecture, okay? Now, let me show you another pile of gobbledygook. This one. Okay, uh, in fact, I think I can, can't I put things side by side on the, on, um, I thought I could do that with Genie. Yeah, whatever. Um, okay, so let's look at this other pile of gobbledygook. All right, so what do you guys see in common and what do you see that's completely different than the other pile of gobbledygook? Or are you just like 
this is just a wall of text and you might as well, I might as well have written it all in Greek. Yeah, okay, that. All right, well, fine. What I see here is each line, okay, does precisely one thing. Okay, so each line of code is doing something. So, for example, let's take, um, let's take uh, this thing here, BL printf or add x29 sp0, okay, or move 5w0, or whatever, okay. So each one of these instructions is doing precisely one thing, moving this piece of data from here to here, or uh, the BL stands for branch and link, and that means basically transfer control to a function called printf. That's what prints something to the screen. Okay. Or uh, some of these other things are like, well, we've seen the additions, uh, move. Okay, so move w0 comma 5 means take the number 5 and put it in this thing called w0, whatever that is. I'll, I'll elaborate what that thing is in a minute. Okay, now if we compare that, so let's find the exact same lines in the Intel version. Uh, right there. Okay, move 5 EDI, whatever that is. Okay, so two different uh, processor families. Okay, x86 is the first one we looked at. The other one that we were looking at, so Intel, that's what's up on the screen right now. Okay, the other one is ARM64. Okay, now, what devices have ARM64 processors in them? Well, it's not my laptop, right? Yes? Uh-huh. Every one of you is carrying one of these in your pocket. Your iPhone has the 64-bit ARM processor in it. Okay, now it's custom designed and custom fabricated by Apple. Okay, but it's ARM architecture. Uh, also, um, uh, Ethan mentioned the Raspberry Pi. How many of you guys have ever heard of those? Yeah. So Raspberry Pi is this thing. Okay, so it's a tiny computer. The, com the board is about the size of a credit card. Costs maybe $40. You, want, you can buy a kit of this that has, you know, a memory card, a power supply, an HDMI cable, you know, basically everything you need to get the thing running except for a keyboard and a mouse for under $100. Okay? And the processor that's on those is a quad-core ARM architecture processor. So... Uh, the guys that are in CS241, they are actually writing this. So if I gave this to my 241 class, they'd know precisely what was going on. Okay, And in fact, I'm having them write uh, programs directly in this language. They're not writing it in C and then hitting the magic button. Okay, They're writing it directly in this stuff. So they are one layer removed from uh, the actual ones and zeros. C is two layers removed from the actual ones and zeros. And then we could say that something like Scratch is probably three layers removed. Okay. And the higher up you go, the more abstract, but also the more friendly and human readable the stuff is. And if we go down all the way to the machine code, like, you know, then it's, um, uh, then what is it? Well, it's like, what do you get when you cross an elephant with a rhino? Elephino. Right, you guys never heard that one when you were kids? No. Okay. All right. So let's actually turn this stuff into the ones and zeros. Okay. For a moment. And kind of look at what um, 
what that stuff looks like. Okay, so I'm going to make two versions of this. Uh, all right, let me make sure I get the syntax right here. Yes, okay. All right, and let me do the other version. Oh, damn it, it would help if I give it the correct. Ah, damn it. There we go, okay. So let me open these two new files that I've produced. Uh, these two things are called listing files. Um, oh, okay, I messed up the first one. Let me redo it. There we go. Okay, so <clears throat> what I've done here um, is I've used a program called an assembler, right? So I took C, and to go from C to this sort of gobbledygook was called a, uh, compiling it. That takes high-level code and produces this mid-level code called assembly. Okay, and then I needed to use another program called an assembler that takes that and takes it down to the lowest level ones and zeros. Okay, so what I've done here is uh, I've produced a file that actually has two different layers printed in the same thing, okay? So each line of this code has uh, two things. It's got an instruction on the right written in the gobbledygook, and then it's got all this number stuff on the left, okay? So for example, let's go down and find where we move the number five into there. Okay, so what I've got highlighted is taking the number five and putting it someplace. Okay, great. That's a perfectly good instruction. And if we want to know what's all the ones and zeros for this, well, we just look over there on the left. Okay, so uh, you'll notice there's two columns of numbers. The first, well, actually three, right? So we've got line numbers. Okay, just to, to, so we know where we are. We also have uh, things that are in four digits there. Those are memory addresses. Okay, and then finally the stuff on the right, the longer thing, is the uh, actual machine instruction. Okay, so BF05 and then followed by six zeros. That's the instruction to move the number five to this bucket called EDI, whatever that is. Okay, now, that's a pretty long number, BF05 followed by six zeros. Yeah? How big is that? Well, how many bits would that have taken to encode? Well, how many bits does it take for each hexadecimal character? Four bits. Okay, how many characters do we have here? Uh, Ten, because there's the... Two zeros, yeah. Right, that, yeah, yeah, sorry. There's eight, yeah, and then two more, right? So it's really 10. Okay, so how many bytes did that, or bits did that take? 40 bits, which is how many bytes? Five bytes, okay? So each byte is a pair of hex characters. Okay, so that took. 40 bits to encode that particular instruction, okay? But other instructions, for example, um, let's take uh, this thing here. This instruction took more, and there are other instructions in here that take less or fewer. I guess it'd be fewer in this case. 
That really grinds my gears, by the way, when you guys mess up less and fewer. Yeah, in English. Yeah, that too. Or done and finished. Yeah. And you remember, you'll never forget that because you're a fourth grade teacher. Oh, you had a male fourth grade teacher? Yeah. Wow. Really? I never had a male teacher in elementary school. Not even gym class. Yeah. So, yeah, anyway. Um, all right, so not all of the instructions are the same length. Okay, now that's a uh, something specific to Intel architecture. If we look at the exact same version of this on ARM, okay, every ARM instruction is exactly 32 bits. Okay, now there's a benefit to that, namely every instruction is exactly 32 bits. The downside, though, is that some instructions you quote waste a lot, right? So it's uh, you're kind of a damned if you do, damned if you don't thing. Um, but uh, yeah, okay. So uh, let's find the instruction that did the moved the number five. Okay, that was right here. Okay, so we've got a zero 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 eight zero five two. Ugh, okay, whatever. Totally different from the Intel version, right? Okay, why is it totally different? Well, because architecturally, an Intel processor and an ARM processor are completely different. Okay, so that sequence of numbers means something. And what we're going to start to do is look at how do we understand what the sequence of numbers does? Okay, and what parts of that sequence tell us what? All right, now are we? We're not going to do this with a real architecture. Okay, ARM and x86 are horrendously complicated, and there are thousands of instructions for these things. Um, so we're going to go back in time uh, to a much older set of instructions. Well, okay, actually, no, that's not quite right. Um, well, here, let me actually just change one thing on my screen for a second. Um, all right, so those of you who are at home, let me change the screen to Safari, Window Capture, Create New, Safari, where are you? Okay, all right, so I'm going to go to, <coughs> this website called 8-Bit Workshop. Okay, now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna load, all right, into our, um, let's do, um, Hmm, how about, let's do something like this. Oops. Okay, so what we have here is a bunch of stuff written in C. Uh, and what I want to do is, well, let me, actually, let's just look at this Hello one, World one, okay? So all this does is it prints to the screen, Hello World. Nothing fancy, okay? Um, that was written in, in C, and behind the hood, there's the, the compiler and the assembler that take that and produce the ones and zeros, and then it gets executed. Okay, now, let's look at the same thing in assembly. Okay, that looks, again, completely different than what we had when we were looking at the Intel and the ARM64 version. 
Now there are some similarities, right? Each line is exactly one instruction, and each instruction is encoded in some way in binary, or in this case it's displayed in hex, but it's encoded in binary. Okay, and uh, how many uh, bits does it take to encode the instructions here? Well, it depends. This one's variable length, like Intel. Okay, uh, so how many does it take? Well, for example, for this instruction right here, it's only how many? 16 bits or two bytes. All right. What about this instruction right there on line 46? It's only one byte. And for the instruction right above it, it's three bytes. Okay, so it just depends on the instruction. Now, this particular architecture, what are we looking at here? What, what processor are we dealing with here? Anybody happen to know? Okay, well, what machine is it inside of right now? Yeah, an NES, an 8-bit Nintendo. Okay, this is 8-bit Nintendo code. Okay, what processor was that thing uh, built around? It was built around the old MOS 6502. Okay, first designed and released in, I think, the late 70s, 78, 79, somewhere in there. Uh, this processor was super famous because guess what else it powered besides the 8-bit Nintendo? Variants of it were in the Atari, the Commodore 64, the Apple II, uh, the Nintendo, and its Japanese version, the, the Famicom. Okay, this was a really big deal processor in the 80s. And it was big deal because it was fast and it was cheap. Right? And that's great if you're writing a game console. All right, so... If there's one line for every instruction, how big is the library of instructions on this processor? It's 140 or so. Okay, so if you wanted to really, really, really know programming on this architecture, you had to understand all 140-ish instructions. That's not that many, but it's still a lot. Okay, all right, so... Let's talk about the architecture we're going to program for, and we're going to do this kind of game for. How many instructions does it have? We'd like it to be a small number, right, so that it's manageable. But if we have too few instructions, then we can't do cool stuff. Right? So it's sort of a trade-off. The more instructions you got, the, the cooler the stuff you can do. But on the other hand, how bare minimum could you get it? All right, so the machine that we're going to program for does not exist as physical hardware yet. That's on my uh, bucket list is to actually design a processor that and build the silicon that, that would do it. It has 12 instructions. Do you think we can handle 12 instructions? Okay. All right, so let's uh, go and let's look at our make-believe processor. All right. Here's our machine. The whole thing right there. It has a whopping 256 bytes of memory. Yeah. And it operates at a blistering fast 0.66 hertz. Okay. I, the, yes, that's what do, you don't see the giant puddle of sarcasm that I'm standing in right now. Hertz. Well, okay, what is 1 hertz, gentlemen? One cycle per second, okay, whatever cycle means, okay? So this thing executes a full machine cycle. It takes um, 
it does two thirds of one per second. Um, so it takes a second and a half to do a full cycle. Okay, so uh, what we're going to do is we're going to look at <clears throat> what are the instructions for this thing. There are 12 of them. Okay, that's it. Um, and then how can we write simple programs uh, and put them in memory and do something with them? Okay, all right, so. What are the other parts here that I haven't explained? So the first off, here's the memory, right? This big grid. It has 256 bytes. So it's a grid uh, that's 16 by 16, right? And uh, each cell can hold a byte of memory, and it's all going to be expressed in hexadecimal. Now right now, what's in memory? Nothing. It's all a bunch of zeros. Okay. Uh, so if we tried to execute this code, nothing would happen because these are not actual instructions. Okay. So that's the memory. Then there's the actual processor, the big gray box over on the left. So what's inside there? Well, we've got some buttons that actually will make it do something. But we've got these things called GPRs. What are GPRs? They stand for General Purpose Registers. Okay, they're basically little memory cells. They can each hold exactly one byte, and they each have a name, in this case, zero through F. So we've got 16 of them. Okay, and all data operations have to take place between registers. Okay, so for example, if I wanted to add two numbers, the first thing I would have to do is load each number into one of these registers and then add the registers that contain them and put the answer someplace else. Okay? Does that make sense? So in C, you would write 5 plus 3, one line. Okay, but how many instructions does that actually take? That would take three. One to load in the first number, one to load in the second number, and the third instruction to actually add them. Okay? Um, okay, now, how do we encode all that? Well, we'll worry about that uh, Wednesday. But I've got 16 of these registers, and I can put whatever data I want in them, and manipulate the data, but as I'm working with it, I have to have it in a register to do it. Okay, now, for reasons that will become clear later this week, do not use register zero. Okay, das ist verboten. Huh? Yes, well, I'd, how was my pronunciation on that? Good. Das ist gut. Ah, danke. Uh -huh. ah. Well, I'm I'm channeling my inner uh, inner bad guys from. Uh, well, yes, but in particular, I was thinking of like uh, Indiana Jones movies, right? Okay, but anyway, um, so everything's got to get loaded into a register. Okay, now there are two other special registers. One's called the program counter, PC for short, and the other's called the instruction register, IR for short. Okay, each instruction on this architecture will require exactly 16 uh, bits to encode. Okay, so uh, how many bits did it take to encode in every ARM instruction? It's 32 bits, every single one. How many bits does it take to encode Intel or 6502 instructions? It depended, right? So Intel and uh, 6502 are not fixed width instructions. They vary. Okay, but ours, for this processor, they're all exactly the same length, and that's convenient. It'll save you guys a lot of headache, believe me. Okay? 
Um, okay, so the instruction register will hold exactly whatever instruction we are currently doing. And the program counter will tell us basically where in memory should we go to find the next instruction. Okay, all right, so that's the architecture. Um, this architecture was made up by the textbook author. Okay, and uh, there's 12 instructions. We'll look at what they are next time and actually start to write code for this thing. Okay, and um, yeah, so we're going to get super low level while you guys are also making awesome video games. Yeah? Okay, now, fear not. Uh, a, some of this stuff is in the book, but B, I have written extensive notes that I will publish to Canvas uh, that I have been working on for a couple of years now, and they're getting better and better every every go at this. Um, and uh, yeah, so in particular, the text, the people that wrote the textbook never actually defined an assembly language for this. They just, you have high level stuff and straight ones and zeros. There's none of that intermediate layer. Okay, so a couple of years ago, I was like, you know, this is stupid. And so what did I do? I made up the intermediate layer. Okay. All right. So we'll quit there. And hopefully the stream worked for everybody since I'm doing it on a different uh, different machine than normal. Um, wear your masks. Don't be an idiot. Don't get locked down yet again, Sig Kai. All right. And you guys have a fantastic rest of your day.